Hello, I'm David Cahoon, and this is the third lecture in the playlist UCL Summer School Analysis and Interpretation of Single Ion Channel Records and Macroscopic Currents Using Matrix Methods. This is the point where we start to get seriously into matrices, so if you aren't familiar with them, you should certainly have watched the earlier two videos, the introduction to the course and the matrices in 45 minutes video. So this one will deal with macroscopic currents. So the object of this will be to show that all of macroscopic kinetics can be encompassed in this one very simple equation, which of course is written in matrix notation. What we'll deal with in this lecture is the following topics. Models and mechanisms, they were dealt with mostly actually in the introductory lecture, the first in this series. The simple macroscopic case without matrices, the matrix formulation of the macroscopic case, the exponential of a matrix, which we've already done in the uh, introductory talk on matrix algebra, uh, but we'll just revise it quickly. Then we'll deal with how you get the equilibrium occupancies. Mostly we're concerned with rates here, but of course, as time goes by, the rates will settle down to an equilibrium value and you can calculate those in the way we'll describe. That will involve some partition matrices and some rate constants and probabilities. And then we'll get as far as doing the general matrix form for the open channel lifetime, which we'll derive later. There are two more topics, 10 and 11 here, which we shan't go through in detail, but I'll put in the description a link so you can download the handouts we wrote, it, wrote about them. They're how to do some of these calculations without matrices, just to show how, <laughs> how complicated they can be without matrices and how simple they are with matrices. By a macroscopic current, we mean anything that involves a large number of channels not a single ion channel. So this is uh, the, the first, the most common thing, in fact, we need to deal with, uh, but it's a necessary introduction to uh, single channel analysis. In fact, in some ways, the macroscopic case is more complicated than single ion channels. This slide, which we've seen before, shows the simulation of a motor nerve the inward current produced at the muscle end plate, which is over 30 nanoamps, so that's a lot of five picoamp channels, and its description is this, this decay, which follows rather well a single exponential curve. So that's a macroscopic current. It involves a large number of channels and it's more or less smooth. And we pointed out also in the first lecture that the reason for this exponential decay is because the individual channels have random lifetimes which are exponentially distributed. And if you add up a lot of these when they open almost simultaneously, then you get this exponential curve, the time constant of which is equal to the mean open lifetime. The half time for this decay is also equal to the median open lifetime of the channel. So how can we calculate, given a mechanism, the shape of this curve? Well, the take home message from this talk will be simple. 
that any mechanism which where the receptor exists in k discrete states the macroscopic current will be described by the sum of k minus one exponential components the q matrix is always singular one of its eigenvalues is always zero the time constants for the exponentials the k minus one exponential components are found from the k minus one non-zero eigenvalues of the q matrix the zero eigenvalue which corresponds to zero rate of decay corresponds to the equilibrium occupancies and these are what are achieved after the exponential components have decayed to zero and the amplitudes of each exponential component can be found from the eigenvectors of q which are used to calculate the spectral expansion matrices a so let's go start off with our simple simplest possible agonist mechanism the del castillo and katz mechanism with the receptor r being bound to an agonist a and isomerizing to the open state subsequently let's just do this uh, by hand first of all the law of mass action says that the rate of any reaction is proportional to the product of the reactant concentrations well rather than the concentrations of receptor we'll use the proportion of receptor in each state so if you want to know the rate of change of the fraction of receptors in the open state p1t that's we label the open state state one then that is the difference between the rate of loss of state one and the rate of formation of state one which you can calculate in this way like the uh, in the similar way the rate of change of the fraction of receptors in this intermediate ar state is given by that the rate of change of the fraction of receptors in the resting state d p3 by dt is given by that so we've got three equations and three unknowns or rather there's actually two unknowns because the occupancies must add up to one and these give us a, a solution which is the sum of two exponential terms because the system exists in three states and it has this general form the occupancy of state one at time t is equal to its occupancy at infinity the equilibrium occupancy plus two decaying exponential components the eigenvalues of q are always negative uh, so these components always decay the two rate constants here come from the eigenvalues of the q matrix and the two amplitudes are found in the way which will come too soon the solution of those three simultaneous equations is very similar uh, to the one that i outlined by hand for getting the shut time distribution but that's left for a handout we'll just deal with the matrix way of dealing with it because it's so very much simpler so we started with those three simultaneous equations so we define a vector a one by three matrix which contains the occupancies of the three states at time t they're the things we want to know 
we define a three by three matrix of the transition rates. Notice that the association rate constants have to be multiplied by the free concentration of agonist in order to get the association transition rate in reciprocal seconds. And with this definition, we can write those equations as simply dp by dt equals p of t times q. So this q matrix is really absolutely central to everything. It defines a mechanism and all the rates in it. So that's the Q matrix for the Del Castillo Katz mechanism. If we number the columns and number the rows, then we can generalize that and say that the Q matrix in general, the ele elements in it uh, labeled QIJ for the ith row and the jth column, then QIJ is the the rate constant for transition from state i to state j. So here's a lot of things you can say about the Q matrix for a reaction mechanism. The off-diagonal elements are the rate, con the transition rates. The the diagonal elements are constructed so as to make each row sum zero. So you just calculate it from the off-diagonal ones. And as a consequence of, of the definition in two, Q is always singular. It has a zero determined, determinant and one of its eigenvalues is always zero. The eigenvalues of Q give us the time constants that describe the, the time constants for the change of the macroscopic occupancy of time. The time constants are just minus one over the rate constants, which are the eigenvalues of Q. The It's minus because the time constant is always a positive number and the eigenvalues are always negative. Those eigenvalues are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, but you don't generally need to know that. The sum of all the eigenvalues is equal to the sum of the diagonal elements of Q and, and that alone is enough to tell you that they depend, every eigenvalue depends on all of the rate constants in the mechanism. So there's no simple relation between the observed time constants and the underlying rate constants. And lastly, the existence of a zero eigenvalue is the reason that the solution consists of k minus one rather than k exponential components. The zero eigenvalue gives rise to a term which is e to the zero matrix, which is just the identity matrix. And that represents a constant or DC, if you like, component. That's something that doesn't decay at all. And that's the, in fact, is just the equilibrium occupancy. And we can see this explicitly when we use the spectral expansion trick to express the matrix exponential as a sum of scalar exponentials. We 
pointed out that the rate of change of occupancies can be written in this very simple form. In general, And we can easily show, and we'll do it now, is that when Q is constant, I, I, that means that neither the rate constants change with time, they're meant to be constants, nor the concentration changes with time, because that's uh, the concentration occurs uh, in the Q matrix. Then the solution is very simple and perfectly general. P of T equals P of naught e to the qt. We'll see in a moment how that can be expressed as the sum of k minus 1 exponential terms, but for the moment we can do it. And that's all there is to say about macroscopic kinetics. It describes every situation where q is constant. And notice that this is a direct analog of the scalar case. If you are considering radioactive decay, for example, we can say that the rate of, uh, of decay is equal to a constant times the amount present at time t. And that the solution of that is p of t equals p of naught, the zero time concentration, e to the minus kt. And that's exactly the same general form as this completely general expression. So that's really very sexy. We'll quickly revise what the exponential of a matrix means, it's defined by analogy with the scalar exponential, which is defined is the, in this way by this infinite series. The matrix exponential is defined in an exactly analogous way, where I is the identity matrix, where, which has ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. It's like a one because multiplying by it doesn't change anything. So we can define the matrix exponential sum uh, simply by adding matrices and multiplying them. And it shows that E to the X is also a K by K matrix. You can also differentiate Q or Q, Q times a, a scalar time QT. And in this case, we can see that the multiplication does commute. It's Q E to the QT or E to the QT times Q. In this particular case, the The, these two matrices, both k by k, the order when they're multiplied doesn't matter, though in general it does. That follows from the series expansion. And that's exactly analogous with the d differentiating e to the lambda t, which is lambda times lambda e to the lambda t. But it's much more general, of course. And it allows us to differentiate, once we know how to differentiate e to the qt, we can differentiate the alleged solution to show that it is indeed the right solution. So we do things backwards as so often in calculus. We postulate an answer and show that it's right. So we want to show that this is a solution of that. So if that's the case, we can put e 
to the QT times P naught uh, for PT, that's the postulate, differentiating it. Well, the P at zero time, occupancy is at zero time, a constant. So they come outside and we just want D to the E Q T X E to the Q T uh, the rate of change of them with time, and we've just seen how to differentiate E to the Q T. It's E to the Q T times Q, so that's P naught E to the Q T times Q. But according to the proposed solution, this bit is simply. P of T. So that will give you E of T that would give you the rate of change of the occupancies with time is equal to P of T times Q, which is what we started with. So, so this is indeed the solution. Now I'll have a, a, another reminder. This was dealt with in the matrix um, introduction to matrices case. I'll quickly summarize it now. How to calculate the spectral expansion matrices of a K by K square matrix. Well, you use the computer to calculate the K column eigenvectors of the matrix. Call those CM. Their vector, so we use a lowercase bold italic, and M of course runs from one to K. Often the subroutine you use to do that will give you the these eigenvectors in the form of the columns of a matrix M K by K matrix M. If it doesn't, then you can easily construct this matrix, the columns of which are the K column eigenvectors of Q. You then calculate the inverse of M because it's not in general singular. And the rows of that inverse are the row eigenvectors of Q called lowercase r. And the K spectral expansion matrices can be found as the mth one is the mth column vector times the mth row vector. That's size K by K. That's K by one, and that's one by K. If you multiply a column by a row, you get a square matrix. You multiply a row by a column, of course, you get a scalar. So now we can go on to see how you find the amplitudes of the exponential components of the macroscopic current. We've got this expression here the occupancies at time t are equal to the occupancies at time naught e to the qt. We now use this wonderful spectral expansion trick to express E to the QT in terms of the spectral expansion matrices and the eigenvalues of the Q matrix. These are, you've got to add up these K terms because there are k spectral expansion matrices and k eigenvalues. But we have pointed out already that one of the eigenvalues of q is zero, it's singular. So let's separate this from the sum and write this in the terms of p of naught is equal to the first spectral expansion matrix p of naught times this 
thing in square brackets, A1 is the first spectral expansion matrix. That's the one that corresponds to zero eigenvalue. And the zero eigenvalue can, gives you e to the power zero, which is one, so there's no exponential component there. Plus the sum of the k minus one components this, this sum now goes from m equals 2 to k, the k minus 1 exponential components, which have non-zero eigenvalues. Well, when time goes to infinity, the k minus 1 exponential components here all tend to zero. So we're, we're left with the conclusion that, that, that at infinite time, the equilibrium occupancies are the initial occupancies times the first spectral expansion matrix. In fact, the only way that this can happen, regardless of what the initial occupancies were, because the equilibrium occupancies should be the same, whatever the initial occupancies were, is the the ith column of A1 has all elements which are equal to the equilibrium occupancies. This is, in fact, another way of calculating the equilibrium occupancies. So we've concluded that we can write the occupancies at time t as the occupancies at infinite time, the equilibrium occupancies, multiplied by the initial occupancies times the sum of k minus 1 exponential terms. So to find the occupancy for a particular state, state say state j, we therefore have to pre-multiply P naught into the jth column of the matrix on the right hand side. And if you work it out, it comes to this, just uh, multiplying out these matrices. The occupancy, scalar occupancy for a single state at time t is its equilibrium occupancy plus the sum of k minus one exponential components. And this is the sum for you get by multiplying the matrices. So here's the exponential decay term. Here's the initial occupancy for state i, and it's summed over all those initial occupancies. And here aj aijm represents the ijth element of the mth. spectral expansion matrix. So if you want to write it in a totally scalar form, we can write that the occupancy for state day time t is the occupancy of, is the equilibrium occupancy for state j plus the sum of k minus one exponential components with rate constants which come from the k minus one non-zero eigenvalues of the q matrix multiplied by these amplitudes and the amplitude for each of the components is given by this expression, which comes from the initial occupancies and from the spectral expansion matrices. We can do a simple example of this if we have only two states and therefore only one exponential. We write our general expression in matrices for the occupancies at time t 
in terms of the occupancy is time zero. So that's when you've got two states, so that's P1 of T and P2 of T. This is P1 at zero time, P2 at zero time. This is the first spectral expansion matrix and the first eigenvalue, second spectral expansion matrix and second eigenvalue. But this first eigenvalue is zero. And it turns out that this first spectral expansion matrix has this form. As I mentioned, it's a way of, you can use it as a way of calculating the equilibrium occupancies. So the occupancy at time zero times A1, the equilibrium occupancies, whatever the initial occupancies happen to be. It's sort of remarkable, but it makes perfect sense, of course. So this is continuing the simple example where there are only two states. We have that expression. If we multiply out the right hand side, this bit, then we get this one by two matrix is one by two times two by two times a scalar. So P1 of T equals P1 in at infinite time, the occupancy of state one at equilibrium plus this bit times the exponential. If you, that's a, a, a one by two matrix or a vector, that's a one by two, and this is one by two. So we can equate the elements on each side and get the time course for state one as this and this time course constant for state, the, the occupancy for state two at time t is that, and the amplitudes of these components are as stated there. So that's the approach to equilibrium. What about equilibrium itself? How do we get the equilibrium occupancies? Well, we've just already described one way, which is to get, to calculate the spectral expansion matrices and the equilibrium occupancies will appear in the columns of the spectral expansion matrix that corresponds to a zero eigenvalue. That, that we've seen has to be the case, but it's not entirely obvious at first sight. The way we do it in programs is not in fact that, though it's a useful check. Um, but we do it from, from this. The rate of change of the occupancies of time will be zero at equilibrium. The occupancies no longer change with time. That's actually a definition of a steady state and equilibrium is a special case of that. But for the moment, we don't need to distinguish between steady states and equilibrium. So we've got as infinite time, we've got P infinity times Q is zero, zero matrix. But we can't solve that by post multiplying each side by Q to the minus one, the inverse of Q, because we can't invert Q because it's singular. So what are we going to do? Well, there is a, a very neat trick There are three methods of doing this, which are given in the single channel recording book. 
pages 594 to 597, if you want the reference, in the 1995 edition. But the simplest of these three methods is to go as follows. It's really rather sexy. The Q matrix might, for example, equal uh, this, if this is a, a, a Castillo Katz mechanism. And what we have to do is add a column of ones to the right hand side of Q, so rather than K by K, it's K rows and K plus one columns now. If we do this in MathCAD, which is what we used for the practical course, then you can do it in this way. We define a unit vector of columns and we augment Q with that and we get this matrix which is called S. And the effect of this column of one is to add a constraint so that the occupancies add up to one. It adds that to the equation. The fact that the occupancies add up to one is the reason in fact why there's only K minus one components. We then multiply S by its transpose and this S times S transpose is invertible and we can calculate the equilibrium occupancies by this equation, a row unit vector times the inverse of S times its transpose. And that gives the equilibrium P infinity vector as 0.794 in state one point oh seven nine in state two point one two seven in state three. These of course will add up to one. So why does that work? It's actually quite sexy. We'll just quickly prove it. We wish to solve P infinity Q equals zero matrix. So we augment Q with a, a column of ones and call that S. Its transpose is therefore can be written in that way. So if you multiply the equilibrium vector by S times its transpose, that's S times, that's the equilibrium vector times this, we get this expression when we multiply out the right hand side. And if you look at these two terms, separately p infinity q q t and p infinity u u t we see that we see that the first term is zero because p infinity q is zero that's what we're trying to solve and the second term is just U transpose, a, a, a row vector of ones, because th th this P infinity U simply adds up the equilibrium occupancies, which must come to one. So we're left with that right hand side just reduces to this row vector of ones. So Summing this up, we're left with that and P infinity is therefore, if we simply multiply both sides, post multiply both sides by S, S transpose, the inverse of it, and that gives 
P infinity on the left hand side and this on the right hand side. Really a neat definition. So that's macroscopic currents essentially done. We'll just run through quickly why the expressions are so simple when written in matrix notation. For macroscopic currents, even in the two state case, it comes out looking a bit long, the occupancy of state one at time t is equal to its equilibrium occupancy plus this expression times e to the minus lambda t one time constant a single exponential but it looks quite long compared with the fraction in state time t for any mechanism which can be written just like that For single channels, things get even simpler because the distribution of open times when there's only one open state is a simple exponential probability density function. But the distribution of open times for any mechanism is e to the QAA t times minus QAA, QAA just being the upper left subsection of the Q matrix that corresponds to transitions between open states. So it is uh, much smaller than the Q matrix in general and that makes it this expression much simpler. The initial row vector and the final column will come to uh, in a, a later lecture. So you can write the duration of shut times, the shut time duration for a Castillo Katz mechanism as a form of, uh, in this form for the sum of the two non zero eigenvalues and two amplitudes. But you can write the distribution of shut times for any mechanism using this expression here where you just replace the set of open states A with the set of, set of shut states F. And this is now perfectly general. So I'll now repeat the take home message for any mechanism with K states. The macroscopic current will be described by the sum of k minus one exponential components. The Q matrix is singular, one of its eigenvalues is zero. The time constants for these exponentials are found from the k minus one non-zero eigenvalues of the Q matrix. The zero eigenvalue, zero rated decay that is, corresponds to the equilibrium occupancies which are achieved after the exponential components have decayed to zero. And the amplitudes for each of the exponential components can be found from the spectral expansion matrices which are found from the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of Q which the computer will give you. And that's it for macroscopic currents.